let's move on. The second topic is by Tony Wilson. Hi, Tony. <laughs> Glad to be, see you. Okay. You too. Let me introduce Tony Wilson. Tony Wilson is an associate professor of evolutionary biology in the Department of Biology at the City University of New York in the United States. Well, his research concentrates on the study of the evolution of reproductive complexity in aquatic environment. Researchers in the Wilson's lab use a combination of field labor laboratory and the experiment approach to investigate how selective pressures contribute to the evolution of reproductive variations across space and time. Uh, good news for Tony that he had got just heard that he will be running his first Boston Marathon in this fall if the COVID-19 permitting. Wow. Like great news. Okay, uh, Tony. I'll share okay. my desktop. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you uh, to the organizers for putting together such a wonderful conference. The the research that I'm going to be talking to you about today was conducted was initiated actually during my PhD work long, long ago um, with Axel Meyer and Constance Germany. But it's been pushed forward uh, to a large extent through the work of three postdocs, former postdocs, Camilla Whittington, Sonny Scoble, and Miley Goche in my labs in Zurich, Switzerland, and now in Brooklyn, New York. Now, like many of you, I've long been fascinated by the striking parallels between male pregnancy and the seahorse and other complex forms of reproduction that we find in viviparous species. My talk today is going to focus specifically on the question of the hormonal regulation of pregnancy and the question of whether pituitary hormones such as prolactin may be acting as master regulators of male pregnancy in these species. The pituitary, as most of you know, is a a very small gland that's located at the base of the brain. And it's the site of synthesis of a variety of different endocrine hormones, including prolactin luteinizing hormone and adrenocorticotropic hormone. Although these hormones are synthesized in the pituitary, they move throughout the body where they have a variety of different physiological effects. Pituitary prolactin is likely best known to its, due to its important role in mammalian lactation but more than 300 distinct physiological functions have been attributed to, a, to a prolactin, including migration, development, electrolyte balance, behavior, metabolism, immunoregulation, and parental care. And as the images shown on this slide attempt to indicate, these functions are not limited to mammals, but they're actually found across a wide diversity of different vertebrate species. The majority of what we know about the function of prolactin outside a small number of model organisms was discovered during the first major bout of comparative endocrinological research that was conducted in the 1950s and the 1960s. At that time, researchers used what we would now consider fairly rudimentary methods, including gross anatomical manipulations and the treatment of animals with exogenous hormones, often derived from outside the species of interest to investigate the function of prolactin in these species. Most relevant uh, for our conference and for my talk today was a series of really fascinating experiments that were conducted by Jean Boisseau as part of his PhD work in the late 1960s. Boisseau fully characterized the morphological and physiological changes that occur during pregnancy in European seahorses, hippocampus, hippocampus, and hippocampus cuculatus. But more than that, he carried out a series of extremely delicate experiments in which he excised the pituitary gland and the gonads from pregnant and non-pregnant seahorses and used exogenous hormones to try to interrogate the function of hormones such as prolactin and testosterone during pregnancy. Boisseau found that hypophysectomy, the removal of the pituitary from the seahorse, has dramatic effects on male pregnancy in these species. 
and leads to the rapid degradation of brood pouch tissues and significant abnormalities in the offspring born from these males. As you can see here, the effects of hypovasectomy differ across the state, depending on the stage at which uh, the operation takes place. And if hypovasectomy uh, takes place early in pregnancy, it has catastrophic effects on male pregnancy. You can see here that there are no normal births from such, from such operations. However, if hypovasectomy is conducted late in pregnancy, um, there are a small number of individuals that, that um, have reached parturition without any significant abnormalities. Boisseau was interested in this temporal variation in the effects of hypovasectomy, and he, was, and he looked more closely at what effects hypovasectomy was having on the male's brood pouch. He found two major effects. The first is that he identified that hypovasectomy causes the rapid regression of brood pouch connective tissue. You can see that here. This is a normal male where you can see the embryos embedded into connective tissue that lines the male's brood pouch. But here in the center, you can see a hypovasectomized male where this connective tissue is entirely absent. Interestingly, Boisseau found that when these animals were treated with pituitary ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, the connective tissue integrity would be entirely restored. The second major effect that Boisseau identified, first of all, he identified that the brood pouch has an important secretory function and that the activity of this brood pouch epithelium varied dramatically over the course of pregnancy. What Boisseau found was that hypovasectomy disrupts epithelial activity and depresses the secretory function. But when these animals, when hypovasectomized animals were treated with prolactin, this would rescue epithelial activity and, uh, and restore the integrity of the tissues. Taken together, Boisseau demonstrated that when you took hypovasectomized animals and you treated them with a combination of pituitary-derived ACTH and prolactin, you could entirely restore the function of pregnancy. The male's brood pouch tissues would continue to function normally, and offspring would be born from these reproductions without any significant abnormalities. Now, I've only just scratched the surface in terms of the variety of research that's discussed within Boisseau's uh, work. And I think that any of us that are interested in questions of physiological and metabolism within signated fishes would do well to look more closely at Boisseau's work. My own opinion is that there are several careers of research questions that are included in this work. Now, while Boisseau's work uh, clearly demonstrates that pituitary hormones, prolactin and ACTH have, have key effects during male pregnancy. It also raises a variety of important questions. First of all, there's the question of whether the co-option for prolactin for male pregnancy in the seahorse has been accompanied by an accelerated rate of molecular change in either prolactin or its receptor. As I demonstrated earlier, prolactin has taken on a variety of different forms, uh, different functions in vertebrates. And when it does so, one often sees an accelerated rate of molecular change at these at prolactin or its receptor. The second major question is prompted by that variation that Bo the Boisseau demonstrated in terms of the effects of hypovasectomy. As the impact of hypovasectomy varies over the course of pregnancy, this suggests that hormones may be differentially important at different stages of pregnancy, something that could potentially be reflected by expression changes in prolactin or its receptor during the pregnancy process. Most significantly for those of us interested in the evolution of male pregnancy, although Boisseau's work is quite interesting, it was restricted to seahorses. And there's an obvious question of whether the effects of prolactin during pregnancy extend beyond seahorses to more rudimentary forms of male brooding in these species. And Finally, while Boisseau's research demonstrates clearly that prolactin has dramatic effects on the brood pouch epithelium, he was unable to determine whether prolactin acts directly on these tissues or whether it acts through an intermediate organ, which would be supporting pregnancy. In order to address the first of these hypotheses, it's important for us first to get an understanding of the molecular evolution of prolactin in signated fishes. The prolactin has a, a really complicated phylogenetic um, history in teleost fishes, and most modern te teleosts have two different copies of prolactin, prolactin one and prolactin two. 
we can use the structure of the molecular phylogeny to identify the timing of when this duplication took place. And if you look closely at the phylogeny, you can see that the, the gar and the elephant fish, um, Le Leptostoius here and Calorhynchus, have both prolactin-1 and prolactin-2. What that tells us is that the duplication of prolactin in teleost fishes predates the divergence of these species from higher level teleosts. So it predates the so-called teleost specific genome duplication. When we look more closely at signated fishes, we see that signated fishes have lost one of these two duplicates and that all species carry only a single copy of prolactin that clusters together with prolactin one of teleosts. This is important because it makes the interrogation of prolactin's function with, uh, during pregnancy much more tractable. Prolactin receptor actually shows a very similar pattern. Um, it is also duplicated into two different forms. But when we look more closely at the phylogeny here, we see that the GAR only has a single copy of prolactin receptor, whereas high telos have these duplicates. And this is an indication that the duplication of prolactin receptor occurred after the duplication of prolactin and was most likely a product of this teleos specific genome duplication. However, here again, when we look at signated fishes, we see that signated fishes only carry a single copy of prolactin receptor that clusters together with teleos prolactin receptor A. Now, with a clear understanding of the evolution of prolactin in signated fishes, and being able to attribute it to particular teleos groups, we're able to address the first of our questions. Has the co-option of prolactin for male pregnancy in the seahorse been accompanied by an extended molecular change in either prolactin or prolactin receptor? In order to address this hypothesis, we carry out an analysis of positive selection that looks at the relative proportion of non-synonymous substitutions at the nucleotide level, that's nucleotide substitutions that change the amino acid sequence, relative to synonymous substitutions, which are expected to be selectively neutral. A DNDS ratio of greater than one indicates that there has been an accelerated rate of functionally important molecular change on a given branch in the phylogeny relative to the background rate of molecular evolution in this group. When you look at the phylogeny for prolactin-1, you can see several branches on the, on, the, on the prolactin-1 phylogeny where there's a dramatically increased uh, rate of DN to DS. And there is a slight indication of positive selection on the lineages leading to Signathus scavelli and Signathus fuscus. But when we look at the major lineages leading to pipefish and seahorses, there's absolutely no indication of an accelerated rate of molecular change at the prolactin locus. This pattern is essentially identical when we look at prolactin receptor. And although there's a single branch on the teleos phylogeny that shows a very weak signal of positive selection, there is no signature of positive selection on prolactin or its receptor during the evolution of male pregnancy. And so we can reject this hypothesis. Our second question is whether pouch activity during pregnancy is reflected by expression level changes in prolactin or its receptor. And the, the first of the experiments to address this question was carried out by Camilla Whittington when she was a postdoc in my lab in Zurich. Camilla's work was particularly important because it wasn't only restricted to looking at the seahorse, but Camilla also included Signathus tifle, a, a species with a more rudimentary brooding structure. Camilla sampled a variety of different tissues in both non-pregnant and pregnant uh, individuals and interrogated the question of what, which tissues could one see expression of prolactin and its receptor? Her experiments found two major results. First of all, that prolactin is expressed exclusively in the pituitary. And this differs from a, a lot of other species in which one often sees extra pituitary expression of prolactin. The pattern for prolactin receptor is quite different. Prolactin receptor is expressed cons constitutively in all tissues. And most relevant for us, it's expressed in brood pouch tissues during pregnancy. And you can see that here in the seahorse and here in the pipefish. Taken together, we see a consistent pattern of gene expression of both prolactin and its receptor in hippocampus and in signathus pipefish. This is our first indication that perhaps prolactin is playing a role during male pregnancy outside the seahorse lineage.
Camilla's research was extended through a series of experiments carried out by Sonny Scoble in Brooklyn. Sonny used uh, qPCR to quantify the level of gene expression of prolactin and prolactin receptor in Cygnathus fuscus, the eastern uh, pipefish species. Importantly, Sonny uh, carried out a series of very delicate experiments in which he was able to separate the minute pituitary of Cygnathus fuscus from the larger brain tissues. In doing so, she was able to separately quantify the expression of, of prolactin within the brain and pituitary tissues. As expected, when we look at uh, the res her results, we see negligible expression of prolactin in the brain. And this isn't a surprise because we don't expect to see prolactin being produced within brain tissues, um, but only within the pituitary. And while we can see um, that prolactin is indeed produced in the pituitary, there is no indication that prolactin uh, levels change over the course of pregnancy. And this final section here, you can see this is a female. There's also no indication that the levels of prolactin expression in the male's brood pouch differs from that of females. However, the pattern for prolactin receptor is dramatically different. Um, when we look outside the male's brood pouch here at gill tissues, we see no significant change in the expression of prolactin receptor over the course of pregnancy, but we can and see a dramatic increase in the expression of prolactin receptor, specifically in brood pouch tissues of mid and late pregnant male pipefish. And this is a strong indication that prolactin is having effects directly on brood pouch tissues. Our final uh, experiment used immunohistochemistry to try to localize the distribution of prolactin and its receptor within the male's brood pouch. In contrast to the previous two experiments that I showed you that are focused on gene expression, immunohistochemistry uses antibodies to look at the distribution, distribution of mature protein. This is important, remember, because prolactin is not produced in the male's brood pouch, but it's produced in the pituitary. It then moves through the body towards its target tissues. When we look at the tissue-specific presence of prolactin, prolactin receptor, and a candidate gene, sodium potassium ATPase, we see that all three of these genes localize to the inner epithelial lining of the male's brood pouch. It's not surprising that we find prolactin and prolactin receptor co-localizing because prolactin binds prolactin receptor uh, within the male's brood pouch. However, however both genes are co-localizing with sodium potassium ATPase. Why is this important? Sodium potassium ATPase plays a critical role in osmoregulation. And this provides preliminary evidence to suggest that perhaps the prolactin prolactin receptor axis is driving pouch osmoregulation. It may also be serving other functions, but this is the first demonstration of what it might be doing within the male's brood pouch. So, Boisseau's pioneering work established the importance of pituitary prolactin in seahorse pregnancy. And unfortunately, Boisseau's work has been largely overlooked by subsequent researchers, probably because it was originally published in French. What I'm hoping I've been able to convince you today is that new tools and new genomic resources allow us to interrogate long-standing questions from a new perspective. So what have we learned? We've learned that pro prolactin is produced exclusively in the pituitary and signated fishes, and that it exists as a single copy gene. We've rejected the hypothesis that the co-option of pro the prolactin prolactin receptor axis for male pregnancy has been associated with an accelerated rate of molecular evolution. We found that pouch-specific prolactin receptor expression increases over the course of pregnancy, and that both prolactin and prolactin receptor co-localize with sodium potassium ATPA's positive cells, suggesting a possible role in osmoregulation. And finally, we have shown clear evidence that patterns of prolactin and prolactin receptor are consistent across hippocampus seahorses and Cygnathus pipefish. Now, there's a really interesting question of whether these patterns of expression are conserved in even more rudimentary forms of male pregnancy. And this is a question that we're obviously very interested in exploring in more detail. Just finally, um, although I kind of criticized Boisseau due to the fact that the methods that he used were relatively rudimentary. The final sentence of his doctoral thesis is really prescient in, in the context of some of the topics that we've been discussing during this year's Signated Bio meeting. 
Boisseau wrote that incubation and pregnancy, despite differences in the organs, the agents, and the conditions, depend on hormonal controls that are fundamentally comparable in females and males. I just wanted to say, um, I think it's really, frankly, incredible just how far we've come collectively since the first Singh bio meeting uh, only 10 years ago in Sweden. At the time, we were speculating about things that we would like to do. And I'm terrifically impressed by the variety of research questions and the diversity of researchers that are involved in these questions. I'm really kind of uh, uh, blown away, sort of imagining what things will be 10 years from now. Where will the field be, given just how quickly we've moved? That's it for me. I would be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Wilson. Uh, does anyone have questions? You can unmute yourself. Hi, Tony. Great talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, I have a question if nobody else is um, jumping in. <laughs> um, I was really interested in your rates of molecular evolution um, and the tree that you showed. It looked like um, uh, Sidnathus scavelli and Sidnathus fuscus maybe were the two that did to the branch to that group did seem to have evidence of positive selection. And I wondered if you had any ideas of what might explain that, um, uh, uh, since it's obviously not male pregnancy evolution. Um, well, th there are certain issues when you carry out these analyses. So the tips of the branch, there's actually not many differences in the sequence of prolactin or prolactin receptor between those two species because they're really close together. The changes that, that do exist are uh, non-synonymous substitutions. Um, due to the fact that that difference is really so subtle, I think I wouldn't put too much evidence on it without a lot more, including a lot more species in the phylogeny. So, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna speculate that it may actually be doing something cool within the species, even though that would be really interesting. Fair enough. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Very fantastic Thanks, work. Sir, sir. Mm.